Hello those new to my channel and returning macabros, and welcome to my latest series entitled The Craft Of, which will serve as a crash course on traditional three-act structure, which is the script structure that the vast majority of Hollywood films released over the last god knows how many decades have utilized. But first, some channel news. I recently revamped my Patreon page with the help of my lovely Discordians, and added some new perks, so if you'd like to give it a look and consider supporting me there, I'd greatly appreciate it. As volatile as YouTube ad revenue can be, ideally I would love to do this full-time and every little bit helps. And as always, if you enjoyed this video or some of my others, make sure to subscribe, like, comment, and share. I appreciate any and all engagement and feedback. If you haven't checked out the previous entries of this series, I would recommend doing so, as I will be building off each entry as we continue. Keep in mind that there may also be spoilers for not only the films I will be discussing in this episode, but the films I discussed in those episodes, so make sure to check the description so you don't get any of them spoiled for you. Today, we will be discussing the second of the five major plot points, the first act turn. The first act turn is marked, more often than not, by the protagonist making a decision in response to the inciting incident, which sets them on their primary journey for the rest of the film. To use the three films I discussed last episode to demonstrate, in Dodgeball, in response to learning that his gym is in foreclosure and he has 30 days to come up with $50,000, owner Peter LaFleur and his friends decide to set out to win the Las Vegas dodgeball tournament to earn the money. In Old Boy, in response to being imprisoned in a hotel room slash prison for 15 years upon his sudden release, Odesu decides to discover who imprisoned him and why. In Argo, in response to six U.S. embassy workers escaping following Iranian revolutionaries storming their embassy, CIA exfiltration expert Tony Mendez decides to have them pose as filmmakers to get them safely out of the country. So let's break down the first act turn. Now this is not always the case, but I would say ideally, and probably close to 95% of the time, this plot point is marked by your main character making a very clear decision of some sort. Let's start with an absurdly obvious example of a character decision marking the first act turn. In The Matrix, following being contacted by Trinity in the infamous Morpheus, Neo is offered a chance to discover the true nature of the Matrix. This is as cut and dry as it gets. Morpheus is literally holding out his hand, asking Neo to make the decision to set off on an adventure. As I said in the last entry, the first act turn is often described as your protagonist entering a new world. Now this is often used metaphorically in that they are setting off on a new course that will carry them throughout the story, but in the Matrix, this is taken as literally as possible. As a side note, something to keep in mind when trying to craft the protagonist the audience can invest in, they need to be decisive, even if they aren't all that active. There are some examples where an aloof passive protagonist can work, but more often than not, since film is a visual medium, and barring films where there is a narrator of some sort, we cannot hear the thoughts of our protagonist as you could in, say, a novel, which may be using a particular POV, allowing the author to express them openly. And thus, what we learn about a character will primarily be demonstrated via their actions, how they respond to certain situations. When faced with insurmountable odds, will they duck and run or stand and fight? If Neo just sat there thinking it over for an hour, maybe call his landlord and bank to set his affairs in order before deciding, it'd probably be pretty boring. The fact that Neo was willing to make this decision right away communicates just how eager he is to discover the truth, thus giving us insight into his character and what is driving him. This is also why it is key to have an active antagonist. You need to have someone or something constantly throwing different obstacles at your protagonist, so the audience can gain insight into who they are and how they change over the course of the film by observing how they react to and handle said obstacles, in addition to the fact that more often than not, they simply make the film a hell of a lot more entertaining. So again, clear and simple. The Matrix has our protagonist make a decision that results in them entering a new world and sets them off on their journey for the rest of the film. However, there are times when your protagonist can make a decision that serves as the first act turn, but without the deliberate intention of entering a new world. In Back to the Future, while checking out his friend Doc Brown's DeLorean time machine, Marty McFly and Doc are attacked by Libby and terrorists. Quick aside, I always forget that a major plot point in this film is literally Doc stealing plutonium from and getting gunned down by legit terrorists. I saw this movie when I was six. Marty attempts to escape by taking off in the DeLorean, which results in him getting sent to the year 1955. Another quite literal example of our protagonist entering a new world. So in this case, 
Marty reacts to the inciting incident, the terrorists attacking, by taking off in the DeLorean, which sends him to 1955, the first act turn. But of course, Marty didn't mean to get sent back to 1955, as him taking off wasn't even that much of a choice, more of a reaction to not wanting to get riddled with bullets. It was a decisive action, and the end result was consequential, but not deliberate. But despite how different these two choices are framed, they both result in the character entering their new world, thus fitting the criteria of the first act turn. Something also to note is how each film does or does not imply the goals and stakes of the story. Last episode, I spoke of how an old boy, while the inciting incident, Ode Su being kidnapped and imprisoned, doesn't explicitly set up the character's overall story goal, it does so implicitly. Obviously, like De Su, the audience is immediately curious as to who imprisoned him and why, which is later established as De Su's main goal come the first act turn. It implicitly establishes the protagonist's main goal as early as six or seven minutes into the film. The Matrix does this as well. When Neo awakens, obviously the audience is like, what the ever-loving fuck, but also we can immediately sense that, okay, judging by the reveal of this drone on steroids, we are probably looking at a man versus machine setup and we're gonna have to kick some binary booty, which is later established explicitly when Morpheus gives Neo the 411 of what's going on and informs him, unfortunately, this is all real and that pill he took wasn't an incredibly potent dose of LSD. And Back to the Future does this too. When Marty arrives in 1955, we don't know right away that he will prevent his parents from meeting, thus needing to rectify this and ensuring his own existence, but even so, we obviously know his overall goal will of course be to get back to 1985. This isn't something we need Marty to say directly to the camera or anything. The audience is simply able to ascertain this without explanation. In these cases, while keeping us guessing in terms of where the story is going, the films implicitly demonstrate the general parameters of the story before they are explicitly established. You can use implicit writing as a useful tool to not have to spoon feed exposition to the audience and allow them to put together what is going on. For example, in Dodgeball, the inciting incident spells out the entire scope of the plot. Pierre needs $50,000, the goal, in 30 days, the time constraint, or he will lose his gym, the stakes. And the first act turn, the boys deciding to play dodgeball to win the 50k, is also pretty damn clear. But in Chinatown, the inciting incident is when the fake Miss Mulray asks Giddies to discover if Hollis is having an affair. But later we learn she wasn't the real Mrs. Mulray, thus the film retroactively changes the nature of the inciting incident. We don't understand its true significance until later in the film. And then the first act turn is when Giddies decides to discover who hired the fake Mrs. Mulray. However, there is never a scene where Giddies talks with his homies and is like, I'm gonna find out who did this. But when we see Giddies start to poke around into Hollis's business affairs, we are able to ascertain what it is he is trying to do, establishing his goal. We don't see him vocalize or make this decision, it is evident in his actions. Chinatown also does this in terms of establishing the stakes, at least initially, for Giddies. Considering we know that Giddies can at any point go home and forget about what happened to Hollis, as he puts it, let sleeping dogs lie, the fact that he is adamant to discover the truth communicates to the audience that the stakes in this case are far more personal, which, as we learn later in the film, is indeed the case. The film is making the audience work in a way, making them ascertain what is going on instead of explicitly telling them. Another film that does this incredibly well is No Country for Old Men. Definitely check it out if you haven't already. However, again, don't allow me to be mistaken. Both implicit and explicit writing have their place, and neither is objectively better than the other. It is entirely dependent on the situation. Implicit writing is just something to keep in mind as it may allow you to trim some redundant scenes or cut down on instances of wordy or spoon-fed exposition that aren't all that necessary since even without them, the audience can reasonably put put two and two together. So to backtrack, the first act turn is the moment where the protagonist makes a decision, usually in response to the inciting incident that leads to them entering a new world, setting them off on their journey for the rest of the film. In the cases of both The Matrix and Back to the Future, this decision is clear and evident and the new world they find themselves in is obvious and apparent. However, this isn't always the case. As I said, the protagonist entering a new world is often meant in more of a metaphorical sense, as opposed to them actually actually finding themselves in a completely new reality or time. Let's take a look at how the first act turn plays out in the social network so I can show you what I'm talking about. The film begins by establishing Harvard student Mark Zuckerberg as a bitter, obnoxious, socially inept dweeb. <laughs> I I I'm just kidding. The film establishes him 
Well, well, actually, no, that's basically how he is established. After getting put on academic probation after creating FaceMash, a website that pits women against each other based on their appearance, the inciting incident occurs when Mark is approached by Divya Narendra and the Winklevi, who ask him to help them develop Harvard Connection, aka Match.com for Harvard Dude Bros. Taking offense to their suggestion that helping them can repair his image on campus, Mark steals, uh, I mean, is inspired by their idea and decides to create the Facebook.com, approaching his best friend, Eduardo Saverin, with the idea and a request for starter cash. So in this case, the first act turn is not marked by some radical reveal or an amazing trip into the past, but just two friends having a chat. The new world they enter into is one in which they set off on a journey together to create a simple website, with neither of them knowing just how large said website will grow to be and how said journey will eventually lead to the dissolution of their friendship. To reiterate, this is totally fine. Some big twist or turn wouldn't really fit the tone and scale of the film. While it is not as blatantly obvious obvious as the first act turn of The Matrix or Back to the Future, it still fits the criteria as the protagonist makes a decision in response to the inciting incident that sets them off on their journey for the rest of the film. Another instance of just how differently the major plot points may play out film the film. So the big takeaways from this episode, aside of course from what the first act turn is and the different ways you can go about delivering it, as sort of a continuation from the last episode, don't fret if your script doesn't explicitly establish the entire scope and parameters of the story within the first 10 minutes. The primary goal only being explicitly established established after the first act turn? Cool. The stakes and time constraint not being made clear until the midpoint? Fine. You still need this information present in the story, but shuffle around where you put it and see what works best. Make the structure comply with your story as much as you do the inverse. And always keep in mind the balance of explicit and implicit writing. Writing is a constant struggle to find the perfect balance between giving your audience the bare minimum of pieces of the puzzle explicitly so they can see the whole picture by deriving information from what is being communicated implicitly. If you think the audience could still get what you were trying to put down, even after removing some clunky exposition or even an entire scene or two, definitely do it. The audience will appreciate you not underestimating their intelligence. But keep in mind that if you get conflicting interpretations from the audience when it comes to character goals and or motivation, perhaps consider making your intentions more explicit, ideally in a clever visual way as opposed to just on-the-nose dialogue, or at least frame it in a way where it makes sense that one character would be delivering said dialogue to another. If you don't make the goals and motivations of the protagonist clear, then this may result in your character losing, well, their characterization, as the audience doesn't have a solid consensus on who they are and what drives them, thus risking them losing their investment. This can be okay if it is something small, maybe give the audience something to ponder and debate why they think a character did or didn't do something, but definitely not when it comes to major decisions that have a large impact on the story, as this may lead to your audience getting frustrated and saying something like, oh gee, I don't know. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Craft Of. Next up, we'll be discussing the midpoint, which I consider to be the most vague and flexible plot point of the main five, but the one that has the potential to turn a mediocre story into one that is truly special and unique. Once again, if you haven't already, head over onto my Patreon page and see if any of the new perks are something you may be interested in. And of course, subscribe, like, share, and comment below. Thank you again for your support, and I'll see you next time.